So this morning on our agenda is picking back up with our New Testament survey. Now, what we had was a good start. We had completed a lot of the puzzle behind the New Testament. We had talked about the Gospels and how they were written and why some read different than other Gospels. We had talked about the book of Acts, which is the history of the church from the ascension of Jesus, his going back up into heaven, to Paul being imprisoned in Rome. And throughout that entire history of the book of Acts, we covered the letters that we have that were written during that time period. So we looked at the letter that Paul wrote wrote to the churches in the Galatia region of modern Turkey. That letter is called Galatians. We looked at the letter Paul wrote to the church at Rome, even though Paul had never been there, Romans. We looked at two of the letters Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in Corinth, Paul wrote more than those two letters to the Corinthian church, but those are the only two that we still have today that have been saved by the Holy Spirit and the church for Scripture. We looked at Paul's two letters to the church at Thessalonica. uh, That's the Thessalonian letters, and that's what we had. We started looking at letters Paul wrote from his imprisonment in Rome. We looked at Colossae, for example, uh, the Colossian letter to the church in Colossae. So that was our start. But we've got some things to do to finish. If we scoot over to that part of the board a little bit more, we've got to finish Paul's prison epistles. He wrote more than just Colossians. He wrote Colossians and Philippians and Philemon, and he wrote Ephesians from his imprisonment. We also need to look at two smaller letters, one called James, and then a one-chapter letter called Jude. And so we'll need to look at those. We'll need to look at the book of Hebrews. We'll spend a good bit of time in that book uh, because it's a larger book. It's actually a sermon, I believe, that was written down for us. So we've got an early New Testament sermon that's really, really useful for us to read. It's, it's got some magnificent things in it, but we need to spend a little bit of time to make sure that we're, we're gathering what it is. And then we're going to look at Peter's letters. We have First and Second Peter. We have John's letters, First and Second and Third John. And then we also have some more of Paul's letters. He wrote some individual letters. He wrote uh, 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 to Titus uh, a letter. He wrote letters to Timothy. And so these are individual letters he wrote after he was released from prison. Then, of course, we'll end with the book of Revelation. It is our goal to get through this by the summer. The summer series will be a different series, one that I'm very excited about. And so we'll get to that later. But today, let's start with the prison epistles or pick back up with those. Specifically, we're going to start with Ephesians. Now, Paul, if you were remembering the story from either this class or just your own knowledge, Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem and from Jerusalem taken over to Caesarea, where he was, uh, uh, Maritima, where he was put on a boat And the boat made its way around through shipwreck and other things. And finally, Paul gets to Rome. While Paul is there, Paul is imprisoned with the Praetorian Guard. So he's actually chained to a Roman soldier on a day-in, day-out basis. And Paul is in chains in Rome rejoicing because he's bringing all of the Roman guards to the Lord. So pretty soon it's no longer the guard who's guarding Paul, but it's his prayer partner and his Christian brother that he's with. It's a magnificent way that the gospel begins to explode even within the ranks of the military and in the heart of Rome itself. Christianity explodes so much within the heart of Rome that just some 25 years after the death of Jesus, there are enough Christians that Nero is able to use them as a scapegoat when Rome burns. We don't know that because that's in the Bible. 
We know that because that's in other historical writings. Now, for many of you, 25 years may seem like a long time. It may seem like most of your life. For those of us who are older, 25 years goes by like that. And your first 25 may seem like a whole long time. Your next 25 don't. (laughs) And the 25 after that, I hadn't gone through them yet. But Dr. Hank down here just went. (laughs) Though I still think your wife looks like she's about 35, so I wouldn't go talking about your age. All right, now... The bottom line, though, is in that short a time, in a world without internet, without telephones, without TV, without radio, without televangelism, in a world without a printing press, in a world without readily available books, in a world without readily available transportation, no trains, no bus service, much less planes, Somehow from a backwater village in Judea, a mountain town called Jerusalem, which is considered the backwater of the Roman Empire, a faith has grown around the resurrection of Jesus Christ that has so changed lives that it in Rome itself, the capital, the hub of the wheel, the Lubbock, Texas of that time period, In Rome itself, you have a massive presence of Christianity due in no small part to Paul's imprisonment. So it's an interesting story. Paul is writing back to the church at, we call this Ephesians. Ephesus was a coastal town then. It's since silted up and is about a mile from the coast, but it was a coastal town 2,000 years ago in Turkey. And so Paul is writing and sending the letter back. You can go to those ruins today. Many people in our class have gone. I think they're some of the most spectacular ruins of the ancient world. The picture that I've put up here to the left, that's the library. That's kind of a cheap picture because it's so incredibly cool to look at but it hadn't quite been built by the time Paul was writing the letter. So it's another 40 years or so before the library. But uh, uh, you can still see the amphitheater where Paul was called in front of the crowd. You can still see some of the houses. They've even rebuilt some of the houses so that you can get a feel for what they were like. Ephesus was a central city. There were lots of little towns around Ephesus. The church was meeting in homes. The church met in homes in Ephesus and in these surrounding towns. So when Paul writes this letter, Paul actually wrote the letter to the churches, not just in Ephesus, but in that whole area. Ephesus being the hub of that area. And it's interesting because if you look at the letter, the letter begins with Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. But if you go back and find our oldest Greek manuscripts, it's very apparent that in many of those oldest Greek manuscripts, this phrase, who are in Ephesus, is not in them. And the reason why is readily apparent, it seems to me. Paul was writing it and sent it to the church in Ephesus, but he wrote it as what's called a cyclical letter. It was a letter to be read at this church, then go over to Faith Bridge, read it at Faith Bridge, and then go down the street, read it at St. Dunstan's, and then you go over and you read it at Prince of Peace, and then you go over and you read this letter in all of these different churches in all of the different areas. But the early church wanted to label it as a letter to the Ephesians so that they could keep it distinct from the letters that went to the other churches. So it seems likely that they inserted that phrase, who are in Ephesus, so that the later generations would know this is that letter that went to the church in Ephesus for all of the churches in that area. 
It's unique among Paul's letters also because it does not have at the end of it, uh, hello to Yodia and Syntyche and all of these different people like Paul's letters generally do. But that is, again, because it was a cyclical letter. Now, some scholars will say Paul did not write Ephesians. And one of the reasons they'll say it is because he does not have those special, unique mentions of people by name like he does in his other letters. I think those scholars have stepped outside of what church history teaches, and they've stepped outside of what Scripture teaches. I don't think this was a letter written by someone who was falsely claiming to be Paul, even if they had the best intentions in the world of Paul's school and the school of Paul. And we'll talk about this a little bit more detail when we look at the other letters that scholars also question whether or not Paul wrote. But I think the scholars that point out that this was a cyclical letter and it only makes sense that Paul wrote it that way are the scholars that make the most sense to me. It's the most reasonable. It's not only consistent with what we're reading in the Bible, but it's consistent with church history as well. And so it makes a lot of sense to me. So that's the way the letter starts out. Now, after Paul does that little greeting, and that's all those first couple of verses are as a greeting, Paul does something that is really cool to me. His next sentence takes 12 verses in English. Now, you don't pick that up in your English Bible. If you're reading it in English, you'll see lots of periods in there. But when you're reading it in Greek, it's like, take a breath, Paul. Finish the sentence already so we can start another one. But he's so wrapped up and enthralled in what he's saying that it is one long, continuous sentence. And it's amazing to look at. So let's look at that one sentence together. I'll put it up here on the screen, and you can, uh, you can see it with me. Okay, let's see here. There we go. Let's make it a little bit bigger. All right, ignore the first two verses. That's just his greeting. Here's his sentence. It starts with verse 3, and it goes all the way down for 12 verses. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is just like starting Paul's engine. He's blessing God. And he doesn't take a breath. He just keeps going. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now our English version puts a period there, but Paul didn't. Paul's sentence continues. He chose us before the foundation that we should be holy and blameless. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he's blessed us in the beloved. Ignore that period. It's not in Paul's. Paul's still on a roll. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for... I mean, it's just on and on and on and on to unite all things in him. Thank you. And it just keeps going and going and going. And it goes all the way down there. Now, I think that's tremendous. I like Paul's excitement. I like the way Paul's mind just is, is not wanting to give anyone a break, but wants everyone to see this flow. This flow from the blessing be God who's responsible for all of these things all the way down the line. 
You know, Pastor David this morning is point number one, put God first because God is first. In the beginning, God created. The same principle is here. God is behind all of these things. And the whole flow is attributed to God. All right, that's enough. We've got to keep going. So I want to get through the whole book today. Okay? This is like, this was, book was, this letter was written to be read in one Sunday. So let's get through it. All right? Now, you need to also pick up, and this is a freebie. We've got a couple of Greek freebies because most of you were in our Greek class. So remember when we talked about emphasis in the Greek? And we talked about how the Greek language didn't bold or underline or... Uh, italicize, they would get emphasis by the word order or by um, repeating the same words over and over. There's an emphasis in here on blessing. Blessing God, God blessing us in the way Paul wrote it. I want to put up for you the Greek. I also want to put up the English to verse 3 of chapter 1, which after his beginning, his, his uh, title, if you will, this is the first substantive verse of text. And in the Greek, you will see this very first phrase that I've marked off. It says, you logo, uh, you logetos, ho theos, kai pater, tu kuriu, hemon, Jesu Christu. That very first word, you logetos, he didn't have to put it first. He chose to put it first because he's emphasizing it. And our Bibles do a good job of picking up on it. That means blessed be. Blessed is the God, Hotheos, Kai, and Pater, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be. But then if you look at the very next phrase, the very next phrase starts out, and can you look at that very first word that I'm underlining? Do you see how much it looks like the first word in the verse? Because it's the same root. Because it's blessed be God, and then here we read, who blessed us. So blessed be God, who blessed us, with, and do you see the word I've underlined in the next phrase? All is before it, but that's blessings. Followed by pneumatike, which is spiritual. By who has blessed us with all blessings. So Paul's harping on this word. He's got it front and center. He's beginning his phrases with it because he wants his listeners to be in the blessing mood. Bless God, he's blessed us, we've got the blessings. And he underlines it. As Paul continues after that big long line, he has what I call the prayer. It's an incredible prayer. The prayer starts in Ephesians 1 verse 16, but it goes for quite a while. And so if we look at this prayer, we will see here, that it is, if we put it up there, 116. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to read this with you, but as I read it with you, I want you to think of someone important in your life to pray for. And so I want reading this to you to stir up within you a prayer for someone, okay? So think of someone you want to be praying for, and let's pray Paul's prayer for them together. May God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you, whomever you're praying for, the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Lord, have their eyes of their heart enlightened that they may know what is the hope to which you have called them, that they may know what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, 
that they may know what is the immeasurable greatness of your power towards the believers, according to the working of your great might, that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, above every name that's named not only in this age, but also in the one to come that you put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen. What a powerful prayer. Now, Paul transitions from here to a, a, a point that he wants the, the, the listeners to really get. Paul says, the walking dead have been made alive in Christ so they can work for God. Now I thought long and hard about the pictures that I could put up here because we live in an age infatuated with zombies. Now we have a wonderful lady down here who is signing this class for the deaf. And I would like her to stand up and show us how you say zombies in sign language. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, I, and, and, and so you look zombie up on the internet because that's Paul's image. Look. And they're gruesome pictures. They're not the kind of pictures that you just put in Sunday school. They're like at least PG. They may be PG-13. I generally try to have a G-rated class. But I'm going to throw it up there. I tried to find one that wasn't too bad. See, here's the deal. Paul says... Oh, that's nothing compared to what was out there. We'll give the, the folks who are watching the signing a chance to look. Okay? Now, here's the deal. We live in 2016. And we've got some hunters out here who are familiar with death. But by and large, we're sanitized to it. Very few of us kill our own meat. Usually when someone dies, they're in a hospital where people come in and whisk them out. And we don't see them until they've been embalmed and put into a casket. And, and we don't, we're not intimately familiar with the appearance of death. But if you go back 2,000 years ago, people were. They didn't have hospice when people were dying. They didn't have an ambulance come take them off and whisk them to a hospital. They killed for their own food, much more so than we do. Butchery was performed in, in a very visible presence. A lot of people sacrificed animals and saw them die cut them with knives, did all sorts of things that we don't do today. The visual image of someone being dead to us is different than the visual image would have been in Paul's time. So Paul says that there are people who are dead in their sins and their trespasses. Oh, they're still walking around. Technically, you might say they're alive, but they're dead. And the visual image and the visceral reaction we should have from that analogy is one that turns our stomach. Paul chose the analogy carefully. You've got people who are dead in their sins and their trespasses who get made alive in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, they're made alive to do works that God set out beforehand for them to do. And Paul says, they didn't earn this life. It was a gift. The life 
the resurrection, if you will, power of Jesus, the resurrection power of God that raised Jesus from the dead gives life to those who are walking dead if they put their faith in Jesus. You trust in Jesus. You say, God, I'm not going to live out of who I am. I'm going to give who I am to you and trust Jesus Christ to be my righteousness and to be the Lord of my life. And when you do that, which is a, a, a repentance of the way you were before, Paul says, you're now walking and you're doing things that God set out for you to do ahead of time. And it's an amazing thing. And it does something else, Paul says. It brings a peace and it brings a unity. Not only in your own life to God, but in the lives that we share together. Because all of us, from all of our different walks of life, those who have uh, um, a heritage of, of being an American, and those who have a heritage of being from a different country and maybe an immigrant, those who have different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, those who have different levels of education, those who have different colors of skin, those who have different senses of humor, all of them are put together in a unique way to build a house that is the house of God. And there's something that's happening here that's really special and unique. Paul says it this way in the third chapter. He says, the mysterion, that's a Greek word, mystery. The mysterion has been revealed. Now, there are two Greek words for mystery. Mysterion, as a mystery, means you had hints, clues, if you will, but nobody really got it until it was revealed. So there's the, the Scooby-Doo, you got the hints, but this is the mystery finally gets revealed. It's the end of the show. Look at the, the, the way Paul uses this word. It's in Ephesians 3, if we can go to the Elmo. Ephesians 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, I assume you know I'm in prison, how the mystery, the mysterion is the Greek word, we get the word mystery from it, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it's been revealed now to his holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is this, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, I have tried hard to figure out what do we have in our era and in our generation that could equate to the significance of Paul saying Jew and Gentile are one. And we've got a number of things. They're the analogies I was giving you before. There are some people who think that money is a dividing line in our society and that the rich need to belong to their country clubs and run in their own social circles and the less wealthy in theirs. Not so in Jesus Christ. Not so in the church. And no one should ever be able to tell the difference in how much money someone has by how they act in church or how they treat their brothers and sisters, whether in the building or out of the building. Now, some might say it's race. 
And I'm going to tell you, there is absolutely no room in the body of Christ for suggesting that there is any difference in people based upon their skin color. And that ought to be the way we treat each other in here. It ought to be the way we treat each other out there. That's how people will see Jesus. Because our society is not that way even today. When I started work at the law firm, uh, uh, not mine, a big law firm back in the 1980s, I was told that we were to treat the secretaries differently than the lawyers because they're secretaries. We're lawyers. That is not the way that things are won in Jesus Christ. It's not based on education. It's not based on occupation. It's not based on any of those things. And God's building this house. This is God's project. And if you don't like it, then you're living in zombie land. Because this is the way you're supposed to be living. It's so important to Paul, he breaks into the next prayer. Ephesians 3.14, look at this prayer, and as we look at this prayer, also um, would you consider who you might be praying this for? Paul says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, every family, doesn't matter what, every family, no dividing line. As David said, Pastor David this morning, God is at the beginning of everything from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That according to the riches of his glory, this is not a miserable thing we're about. Treating people with love and dignity and seeing them as equal before the Lord is not about, oh, why do I have to do that? This is a glorious thing that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, not just the ones of your ilk. What is the breadth? What is the length? What is the height? What is the depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God? It's amazing. And then he caps it off with this beautiful promise of praise to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask, than all we think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen, Paul. Tremendous lesson there. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. What Paul does in most of his epistles is he'll spend the first half being kind of theological. And then he spends the second half being practical. So he's been giving us theology, even though it's practical theology, but now he starts getting down to practical. And as he gets down to practical in verses in chapters 4, 5, and 6, he starts out with this principle. He's still on the subject that we were on, but here's what he says. There, the many, all of us, the many are one because he is one. The many are one because he is one. Look at um, chapter 4. He says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. Boy, he just keeps bringing that up, doesn't he? I'm a prisoner for the Lord. I'm a prisoner for the Lord. Look, it's one thing for someone sitting in the sweet honey hole to tell you about life. It's another thing altogether for someone who's in chains, who's in bondage. On your behalf, because he's on the behalf of Christ, 
He won't deny Jesus. He'll go to prison and die for Jesus. He's got room to talk. He's got cred. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility, gentleness, and with patience, bearing with one another in love. Look at this. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. There is one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. Even as he's given us each our measure of grace and our gifts and made us different. It's tremendous. There are many, but the many are one because God is one and he's building us into one house. From there, Paul starts talking in very practical terms about what the dead look like. What does the zombie look like? Now, let's go back to the text, and we're going to look at it in chapter 4, but we have to go back first to chapter 2 and show you the verse. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience. That's what you were. And what did that look like? Here it is, verse 17. Don't walk anymore as the Gentiles do. Don't walk like the zombies. Don't walk like the walking dead in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding. I got a time out here. I got lots of young people in here. I want to tell you something. You have a choice in your life. You walk in the light, following Jesus. Or you choose to shut out some of that light because you're finding things in the darkness that are enticing you. The darkness will darken your mind. It will dull your senses. It will produce in you a futility, and it's got long claws that will try to hold on to you and get more and more of you. It will try to suck you in. The light is liberty. The light is wisdom and, and knowledge and, and clarity. The zombies, they're darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Their hearts are hard. They've become callous. They've given themselves up to sensuality. They're greedy. They practice every kind of impurity, even though that's not the way they've learned in Jesus. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, that's what the dead man looks like. Now, Paul then says, let me tell you what it looks like if you've walked out of that death, left that death, been born again, and you are a living believer. And he shifts to that here with verse 25. He says, well, here's the transition passage. That's not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you heard about him, you were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, is corrupt through deceitful desires. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. What does that mean, Paul? Well, let me explain, he says. You put away falsehood. You speak the truth with your neighbor. You can be angry, but don't sin. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give an opportunity to the devil. If you're a thief, stop it. Work. Honest work. Not for yourselves either. You work so you will have something to share with someone else who needs. That way, you'll not only fix your own thieving, but you'll stop theirs too. It's a twofer. 
Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, for whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What does it mean, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Paul's already said it's the Holy Spirit that is at work in you to enable you to do these things. It's the Holy Spirit that's given you life. It's the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets you free from the law of sin and death. It is the Spirit and the power of the Spirit that resurrected Jesus that pulled you from being dead in your trespasses. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Can you imagine what kind of person you would be perceived as if at work or at school or wherever you are, when people start talking bad about someone else, you don't? Maybe you even change the subject. Or maybe you just leave. And pretty soon you're known as the person who doesn't talk bad about anybody. And, and more of Jesus starts shining through. So you be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted. Forgive one another. I mean, heavens. We of all people know what forgiveness is if we're Christians. So we need to be forgiving. So for Paul, if we go back to the PowerPoint, that's what the living believer looks like. And that's what we're called to be. We're not zombies anymore. We're happy. Workers for God. Paul transitions from there into various faces of submission, as I call it. Because there are different areas of submission in our lives. We submit, of course, to Christ, but we submit to one another as well. If we look at Ephesians 5.21, there's an interesting thing in this passage that sometimes people don't know because they're reading English instead of Greek. Paul says, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submission is something we are all doing to each other. That is not hupakuo, the Greek word for obey, though that word is used later for children to obey your parents. But it's the idea of not asserting your own rights over the rights of others. It's the idea of being in submission, being in a, in a relationship where, where your concern is for others. And it's interesting because, now, Dr. Bob, you're sitting there with Kelly. And so this thing, wives, submit to your own husbands, is to the Lord. Don't you go home and preach that to Kelly. Because I know you. You're going to tell her to underline that in her Bible. And Bob would be saying it with all great affection because he loves his wife dearly. But he would not mean it as funny as it would sound. I want to tell you something. I believe in that verse, and I believe it's translated properly, but you want to know something interesting? This verb submit is not in the Greek. Not there. It's implied from the sentence before. What it really says in the Greek is we're submitting to one another, wives to husbands, is the husband's the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body is his savior, as the church submits to Christ. So also wives submit to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Those two go hand in hand. When I was a young boy, um, I heard a sermon. We're now let's down the Elmo for a minute. And here's the sermon on this passage. Now, I was not married at the time, but it stuck in my brain because it seemed right, and it still seems right to me today. So this is marriage class 101. 
I couldn't teach this back then because I wasn't married and it would have sounded idiots. But I've been married for like ever. <laughs> Seemed like a day, Becky. <laughs> and I am, as a husband, to have the relationship to my wife, to love my wife as Christ Whoops, that would be wife, sorry. I am to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Okay, now, you with me? That's what Paul says, right? Let's start making a list of things that Christ did for the church he loved. Gave himself 100% while the church ignored him, trampled on him, was unfaithful, and generally rotten. We can stop right there. But here's the relationship that was shown to me when I was uh, in high school. It was God the Father was the sun. We should use the yellow marker. And God the Father shines brightly. And Jesus was in a sense the moon. Now, we know what the moon is because the moon is reflecting the light of the sun. The moon doesn't have light on its own. It reflects the light of the sun. And Jesus said, when you see me, you're seeing my Father. I'm here. I show the life of my Father. And then Jesus, for the church, reflects the life of the Father. But Jesus then becomes the Son. So we have God the Father as the son for Jesus. And then Jesus became the son for the church. And that's what the church is. The church is called to reflect... Oh, that was son like that. To reflect the son of God, Jesus. To reflect the son. Now, husbands, you need to love your wives in the same way. So the husband needs to show the wife those things that the husband would like the wife to reflect. So if I expect Becky to respect me, don't I need to respect her first? And that's my responsibility. So you see, it takes that submission idea that we have in our century and our age and turns it upside down. This is not, you respect me, you're supposed to submit to me. It's, I'm going to show you respect so that you've got it to reflect back. I'm going to show love, unconditional love. I'm going to show devotion. I'm going to show faithfulness and loyalty. I'm going to show commitment. And that's the image that Paul gives there, and he, and he takes it even further. All right, go back to the PowerPoint. Paul then has an, and, and he walks through some others too. He walks through submission in the workplace. He walks through submission in, in the home with children and things of that nature. Then he closes with an obvious analogy. Why do I say it's obvious? He's chained next to a guard, a Roman guard, who's got his Roman guard gear on. So it's real easy for Paul sitting there, and no doubt, Paul's probably not writing this letter. He's dictating it. So he's got the guard next to him, chained next to him in all of his regalia, as Paul dictates the following. Paul says to him, all right, Tychicus, now take this down. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against 
the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So take up the whole armor of God. Fasten the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate. And you just wonder if while Paul's dictating this, the Roman soldier standing there, you know, chained to Paul, is it, does he kind of turn around and become the catalog model for what Paul's doing? You know, it's kind of like, Because Paul's dressing down the soldier and the soldier's hearing it. But Paul's taking what that soldier knows will save his life in the real world and turning it into what we need so that we can live not as walking zombies and the walking dead, but alive in Christ. So we put on the belt of truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We put shoes for our feet that have been shot in the gospel of peace. And keep our shield of faith to extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. We wear a helmet of Jesus, the, our head, the helmet of salvation. We have a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times. Being bold to proclaim the mystery, mysterion of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. But I declare it boldly, chained to that Roman guard. Here are your points for home. Oh, I always ask for a Greek geek cartoon. I'm not doing any more of those. They're gone. But, Janet Seifert, one request, I'll do one last one. Hey, geek, why do Greek verbs help keep Paul's writing riveting? Hmm. Because the verbs are all intense. <laughs> okay, they're gone. Don't worry, they're over. Intense. You know, the, the tense of a verb. Okay, that's all right. Points for home. I do not cease to give thanks for you in my prayers. Let's make this a year of prayer. Make it a year of prayer. Got this really cool new prayer app on my phone. It's free. I hadn't figured it all out how to use it, but I'm using it. It's, uh, 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 it is a uh, prompter. Whoops. Let me go back to the, there. It is prompter. Can we put my phone up on the screen? There we go. Oh, that's, sorry, that's my daughter's playing goofy. Prompter, prayer prompter. It's amazing what it does. So it's got all these things for prayer and meditation. And it brings it up for you each day. And it's got all these things to prepare. It's got all this intercession and all these different categories and who you pray for, and, and how often you pray, and, and all of this stuff, and, it's, and you click on them, and it's got, you know, I click on my church, it's got you. It's got Pastor David, and Pastor Stephen, and others here, and Pastor Brent. Anyway, back to the PowerPoint. So, I want to pray this year. You were dead in the sins in which you once walked. See the zombie for what the zombie is. Because we don't want to walk that way. We want to be imitators of God. We want to walk in the light. And reflect the light to this world. Can I bless you before we go? And actually, Lord, I ask you to bless. I just pronounce the blessing in the name of Jesus. You who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings, pour those blessings upon the hearts, the minds, the bodies, the families, the workplace, all of the areas that just need to be a wash in your blessing, Lord, for those who hear this message. Would you bless them in the name of Jesus? May they see it for what it is and walk in the blessings. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Amen.